camp. Now, let me ask you this question. If you could identify one cause for the decline of people in the United States that identify as Christian, or one cause for even the declining Christian values in our country, what would you say is the one, one cause, right? The, the one pivotal thing that has had probably the most drastic effect. As I think about this question, I, I even think about this series, right? We're looking at habits uh, that after you repeat them enough in your life, they really become a part of just who you are. Right, it's just like you got the person that sometimes they refer to him as a gym rat. Why do they become a gym rat? Because they go to the gym every single day. Right, it just becomes a part of their identity. When we look at these habits, we've talked about generosity. We just become a generous person. That's what a disciple of Christ looks like. Right. We talked about last week our uh, the the Holy Spirit's relationship and our interaction with the Holy Spirit in our life today that just becomes a part of our identity. But I think there's one thing that I could point to that is quite interesting that you see it was a habit and a character quality of the early disciples and you see it a lot less in today's age. In fact, just looking at some statistics in 2020 in the United States of America, 65% of Americans identified as Christian. 65%. This was down from 75% that was just like four years before. So there was a decline in people identifying as Christian. But what's most like startling to me, what grabs my attention the most in all of these statistics is... Even though there's 65% of Americans in 2020, and it may be less at this point, identify as Christian, only 9% identify as someone who opens their Bible four times a week and believes that it's God's Word. And I think the gap that we see between the people who say, sign me up, I believe in Jesus... And the people who say, sign me up, I want to shape my life according to what the Bible says. That gap, I think the longer that it exists, the more we're going to see a decline of people who identify as Christian. They're getting separated from something that is very core to what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Because you can look in the New Testament, you see that there was an interaction with Scripture. There was a, an approach to Scripture, a belief about Scripture that, that shaped the disciples then. And it should shape disciples now. And so today I want to lean into that. And if you look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, you get a... A picture of how the first disciples viewed this. Because you get to see how one Paul was celebrating the way in which these people received God's word. This is what Paul says. He says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is the word of God which is indeed at work in you who believe. It's interesting. There's a, there's a lot in here. There's, a, there's how we receive God's word, right? And then how we receive determines what gets produced in us, right? What, what I want you to understand today is that disciples of Jesus allow the Bible to work in them when they accept it as God's word. And so there's, there's, a, there's a, a balance here, right? It's, it's how I view God's word, but also how I implement it into the way that I live my life. And the early disciples said, this was God's word and I'm going to shape my life accordingly. I think that we need to close the gap between people who say I'm a Christian and the people who say... I shape my life according to God's word. 
And as we allow those two things to mean the same thing in our lives, I think that we will see a drastic change in our homes, a drastic change in our cities, and a drastic change in our culture. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is God's word at work in our lives? Is God's word at work in my life? Like if I were to stop, close my eyes, and reflect on the past seven days. In the past seven days, has there been a moment where God's word has been applied to my life and it has been able to begin working, begin producing, begin doing something inside of me? Well, statistics say that for the vast majority of people, the answer is no. It hasn't. And some people are, are living off of the scripture that was deposited in them at a younger age. Right? And some just don't understand the value of scripture. And, and at the same time, some misunderstand what it's going to produce in us. We, we live in a world today where if you spend a lot of time on, on different media outlets, then you may be concerned that... If you become someone that builds your life on what the Word of God says and values it as holy scripture, then you'll become outdated and you'll be intolerant. That you're just going to be judgmental, you'll be self righteous. These are the views that people have towards those with a biblical worldview in our society. You're inflexible and closed minded. A hypocrite. You'll exclude others. That you can't believe in science or intellect if you base your life upon God's word. I think these are some common misunderstandings of what the Bible and building your life upon it will produce in your life. I think it's also important for us to understand how we're approaching it. There, it's very common in our society today for people to approach the, the, the Bible in various different ways and, and find value in it in very different, various different ways. For some say, hey, this, is a, this is a good book for historical or literary purposes, right? There's, there's some things that I can look in, I can understand some of what happened through history. Some would say, hey, this is a great cultural or moral uh, teaching uh, value for me, right? Like, I like the teachings of Jesus, and I like the Proverbs, and I like what the Bible uh, can teach me. Some people in society look at the Bible as just mythology and folklore. Some have it, uh, skepticism or a disbelief about it, and uh, there's a lot of indifference Little interest or engagement with the Bible altogether. So you have this, this thing, which in the day and age we live in has been bound together, printed, and, and, and put together in a collection that's easily accessible. I mean, even now it's digitally accessible, right? We can carry it around with us everywhere. These texts... That really, if we were to see them in their original context, it's much like Indiana Jones uh, uncovering some archaeological dig, right? We, we've got these ancient texts that have been preserved throughout history, meticulously copied over and over and over to make sure that these words could be preserved for our day and age, preserved for us. And so when the Bible is put in our hands, we have to go, what does it mean in, in my hands? I mean, think about it this way. A lot of different things have different values when they're put in the hands of different people. A baseball bat in my hand may mean um, a strikeout, right? But you put it in Babe Ruth's hands, it's probably going to mean a strikeout most of the time too. But he's going to get a lot of home runs, 
where I wouldn't, right? You put a basketball in Michael Jordan's hands, and all of a sudden something magical happens. You put a tennis racket in Serena Williams' hands, and something spectacular happens. You, you get a paintbrush, and you put it in Bob Ross's hands, and you get happy trees. If you put a Bible in the hands of a disciple of Jesus Christ... Oh, something amazing happens. Something begins to happen inside you. And something begins to happen to the world around you. When you put the Bible in the hands of a disciple of Jesus. Who says, I view this as God's word. And I'm going to shape my behavior, my attitudes, my approach to myself. My approach to God. My approach to the people around me. Based off of what this says it's a powerful thing when we can close that gap not just in society but in our own lives of what does it mean when when the bible's put in my hands because a disciple of jesus needs to handle god's word as god's word disciples of jesus need to allow the bible to work in them And that happens when they accept it as holy. It has its greatest impact in the hands of a disciple. And you should see the Bible consistently in the hands of a disciple. So how do we understand the value of, of God's word at work in us? I think there's a lot we can zoom in on and learn from this scripture where Paul is teaching this young pastor Timothy and in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 he says a lot in in a couple sentences that I really want to unpack I want to put under the microscope and and see the value of this is what Paul says to Timothy he says all scripture all scripture Which, there's a common thing even within Christian movements today to go, well, let's really build our life upon the New Testament and let's throw the Old Testament out. I want you to know when Paul says all Scripture at this point, he's referring to the Old Testament. Right? He says all Scripture is God-breathed from God. He's going, I understand that, that Moses wrote this. I understand that Daniel wrote this, but I want you to understand that it wasn't by their hand alone. It was by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that these things were written and preserved for us. All scripture is God breathed. And then he says, it's not just that. It's not just that we take this thing and we just hold it up and say it's holy. He said it's useful. I like that. I like useful. I like you like that, that's the rules I have around buying stuff, right? It's like, okay, can I wear that pair of shoes with more than one outfit? See, that works for men. I've learned that really doesn't work for women, right? It's like, no, I need a pair of shoes for this outfit. That's that. But for me, like, it's like, can I use this in multiple different arenas of my life? Well, it says God's word is useful. Useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So let's zoom in to these different useful aspects of scripture for just a minute. First we understand that in the hands of a disciple, God's word produces divine coaching, right? It encourages us, it teaches us, it guides us in how we live. The the words from this scripture, it says, is that all scripture is useful for teaching. For teaching. Sometimes we think about teaching and we think about our worst teacher. But I think sometimes it's more beneficial to think about our favorite teacher. Right, our, our favorite teacher that when they explain things, it just felt like light bulbs just went off in our mind. It's like the world just started making sense. And, and Paul is saying, listen, Scripture is so useful for teaching us. 
Not just teaching others, but even teaching ourselves. Because when we lean into it, we, we understand things. And it's not just about amassing more knowledge. That can happen too, and it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to just read the scriptures and, and learn like, well, Adam had, you know, two sons and, you know, then they begat so and so. Because listen, there's some of those things you're like, I don't know what I'm getting out of this, but I know a lot of people begat people and they lived a long time before the flood happened, right? But imagine if you, you, you were trying to make sense of some of the things in the world and you're like, why, what, why, is, why, is the Mount, why does Mount Sinai look like it's been set on fire? Oh, well, we understand from God's word that actually God descended on Mount Sinai in, in flames and in the storm when he met with Moses and he gave the law. Oh, well, I guess that makes sense why it's black, right? Like, how do, how do we, like, how did the world come to be? Okay, we, we've got scripture to help us understand how and why it came to be. There's a lot about this world that we can understand that Scripture teaches us. There's a lot of things that people are confused about today that Scripture teaches us and brings clarity to. And I think it's important for us to see the value in, in each of these elements of Scripture of going, okay, there's a value for someone else, but also, why don't I start with the value for me? In in the hands of a disciple, in my hands, am I allowing God's word to teach me? To teach me about who God is, to teach me about who I am, to teach me about this world and my place in it. Romans 15, 4, when Paul writes the Roman church, he says this, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. There's something powerful about the teaching that scripture does. We understand right and wrong. We understand how to live. But in the hands of a disciple, God's word also produces an inner confidence. It's interesting that when you really start to look under the microscope of, of this verse... The way Paul says it, he says that it's useful for rebuking. Now, this word rebuking, it's, it's kind of interesting that some of the English translations use that because it, it really means proving. It, it means a, a conviction. Some translations even use the word conviction. It's useful for conviction. Now, if you only look at Scripture as what it can do for someone else, then you just may see some of the abuses of Scripture and society in this, right? It, people have used God's Word to belittle, to put down, to ostracize, to, you know, maybe you grew up in a hellfire and brimstone, right, uh, church that was like, you, you turn or burn, right? And... We can see that, and in a way we can like, whoa, 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 it's used for rebuking. But what Paul says is it's actually useful in that case. So maybe there's actually a helpful, beneficial aspect of this, right? That when we show up in the world, it's not to point a finger at someone, but it's a point of finger at the truth for someone. And in all of these instances, they become way more valuable if we start by pointing the finger to ourselves and saying, is God's word at work in me? Is it producing an inner conviction, an inner confidence? Think about it this way. When I build my life upon God's word and I encounter a situation that is not congruent. Yes, the Holy Spirit can bring conviction in the moment, but I also have God's word. I also have God's word. Like, whenever I have been hurt, maybe you've been hurt, statistics show, and Jesus even said, well, I'll be hurt, 
We'll all be offended with someone at some point in time. Someone will offend us. We will, we, we will want to gravitate towards unforgiveness and bitterness in our lives. That is our natural tendency. You hurt me, I'm going to be hurt by you, and I kind of have a desire to hurt you back. But because of God's word, whenever I want to think those hurtful thoughts, all of a sudden there's something inside me that goes, no, 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 no. See, we want to look at the world and go, I rebuke you. But sometimes I need, the, I need the God's word inside of me going, I rebuke you, Jason. Quit, quit thinking those thoughts. Walk in freedom. Release them. Forgive them. And it's because of what God's word teaches. It gives me a confidence to know, okay, I, I don't step this way. But this is the way in which I should go. There's a confidence, you know, the, the Bible even says to raise a child up in the way that they should go and they shall not depart from it. And it's like taking God's word and te- using it as principles for the habits and the disciplines and the culture of your home that you create. And it builds a confidence for how you can live. It's interesting, this word for rebuking here is actually only used one other time in the New Testament, and it's for the word confidence in Hebrews 11.1. 1. And this is what it says, now faith is confidence, this is the same Greek word, in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. God's word produces an inner confidence. God's word also produces helpful correction. I, I rented a car a couple years back. I, uh, I, I was flying into, uh, it was, I think it was, no, it wasn't Jacksonville. It was another city in Florida. I'm trying to remember. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere in Florida. And I was heading to this place about an hour away. I went to the car rental place, and I said, I just need the car that's going to consume the least amount of gas. I don't care which car that is, as long as it's going to consume the least amount of gas, because I just have to drive a long distance in this thing and I really don't want to spend a lot of money paying you for fuel and so they put me in this little like hybrid car and I start driving down the road and I realize it's got this lane assist feature none of my cars had this lane assist feature and so I'm driving down the road I'm like I'm about to figure out something I'm gonna figure I'm gonna push this little button see what happens But I literally could take my hands off the wheel and any time I would drift and it would start to seem like the car was going to go over the line, all of a sudden it would adjust and it would keep me in the lines. God's word functions much the same way in my life. Anytime I start to, to veer off, if I am reading and applying his word to my life, and if I hold it up as a high value and voice and how I should live, then any time I get close to the line, there's a correction, a course correction. Now, in our world, we don't really like correction. We've kind of got this culture and this society now where we're afraid of hurting people's feelings. We're afraid of hurting our own feelings. We don't know how to deal with that kind of experience. And so we tiptoe around uh, ourselves. We tiptoe around the important people in our life. We tiptoe around society. And we're afraid of correction. But I've found that correction in the context of a healthy relationship is often very beneficial. And can be received very well. See, we're afraid of it because we're oftentimes afraid of conflict. But conflict isn't all bad. Actually, it can produce all kinds of positive things in a healthy way. And the same thing is true for God's Word. It often tells me something contrary to what I would naturally do. And so now there's conflict. Like I said, sometimes I don't want to forgive. In my feelings, I want to be bitter. But God's word corrects my feelings and says, no, but this is the way in which you should go. 
When Erin and I were dating, listen, when Erin and I started dating, I was 15, she was 14, right before she turned 15. We dated all the way through high school. We got married in college. And I can tell you something. I, we learned a lot about what God's word said about purity, and that saved us. But I wish somebody would have taught us a lot about boundaries. Because we wove way too close to the line sometimes. And when we get close to that line, all of a sudden, scriptures, boop, 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 correction, correction, lane assist, right? And they're like, boop, 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 boop. And, and I welcome that correction in my life. I think we need to welcome more of God's correction in our life. And these three things, this, this correction, this rebuking, this teaching... These are powerful tools. Even if you go to chapter 4 of, of 2 Timothy, you see Paul's teaching and he says, listen, uh, he says, take scripture, be prepared to teach it in all situations so that you can correct, rebuke, and encourage. It's kind of interesting he uses the word encourage in, in instead of teach. But I think he uses them oftentimes as a synonym. These three things are, I found, even in leadership, a helpful way. If you're over a department, if you're over a group of people, if you're over children, if you're over any group of people, this is, I found it's even a helpful pattern for me. So a little, little leadership lesson, for a little leadership lean-in for some of you. Like, we, we start with encouraging someone. If, if, they're, if they're off course, we need to go, let me lean in. Do they even know what on course looks like? Right? Let, me, let me correct, let me encourage them in the right way. But if they keep veering off course, then my, my teaching and my encouragement turns into a correction. Hey, let, let, me, let me address the fact that you are heading in the wrong direction. And let me point what the right direction is. Let me draw a, a, a contrast for you so you can see where you're doing versus what you should be doing. And if someone consistently fails to course correct under correction, then a rebuke is necessary. Sometimes in the, in the context of, of a, a business, that rebuke may be, uh, you don't get a paycheck no more because you don't hold a title here anymore, right? I wonder, though, if we applied these same principles in our life as the leader of, of how we disciple ourselves, right? We, we train ourselves. God, God I'm, I'm going to start off and I'm going to encourage myself with your word. I'm going to start my day with your word, putting it in my life, teaching myself what your word says about you, about this world, and about myself. I'm going to, I'm going to teach and encourage myself. And I'm going to use it when I start to cross over the line. I'm going to allow your word to correct me. And if I go too far, I welcome your rebuke. I welcome your rebuke. Why? Because this last thing I think is so important. God's word produces transformational challenge. It's useful for training in righteousness. Training in righteousness. I remember playing baseball when I was young because I grew up in the south and every young boy had to play baseball if you grew up in Georgia. It was just kind of a thing. And uh, so from the time that I could hold a glove until the time that I realized I was no good at holding a glove and swinging a bat, I played baseball. But I remember my favorite coach, Coach Jones. He was so good because he was so challenging. Every practice, we would show up and we were running drill. We were the most fit team in the whole league. And I remember we would show up to games and we'd get there early. While the other team, they're like sitting on the ground, doing a couple little stretches, kind of nonchalantly. We're over there looking like a military troop. We're just one, two, three, one, one, two, three, two. We're doing all these. And I just remember the whole time I'm going, the whole time we're doing these workouts and the whole time we're doing these drills and the whole time I'm just going, we're going to crush this other team. And the other team's looking at us going, who are these people? And I just going, man, I loved what 
that coach produced in me. It challenged me. And it trained me to be better. It says scripture is useful for training in righteousness. Now we do know from scripture that our righteousness is like filthy rags. What we try to produce in ourselves, it still falls short of the glory of God. But we also know from God's word that we are clothed with Christ's righteousness. With Jesus, we, we, are, we get put on us when, when we accept Jesus, the righteousness of God. Wow, that changes things. Now, I, I got to start training my disciplines and my habits, my thoughts, my approach to life, my approach to people. I gotta start training myself to start matching this new uniform I'm wearing. He's made me right with God. So now I need to take his word and hide it in my heart. Why? Because 2 Timothy 3.17 says this, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped. I imagine with 65% of people saying they're Christian and only 9% saying that they consistently open God's word, that there's a good chance that there's a lot of people that are Christians that love God, believe in Jesus, and don't feel thoroughly equipped. And they step into situations of temptation. They step in the situations of challenge. They step in situations that needs Christ's character instead of the one that they saw modeled in their home growing up. They step into all these situations and they don't feel equipped. But scripture helps us. And a disciple of Jesus, when the Bible is put in the hands of a disciple of Jesus... We go, I'm going to do whatever I can to show myself approved. I'm going to do whatever I can to understand it. There are some parts that are easy to read, and there are some parts that are hard. There are some parts I would say, read this every morning. And there are some parts I would say, you need to study this, and you need to get some tools out, some Bible study tools to help you understand what is being said here. We're dealing with some ancient texts that have been preserved throughout time because they're God-breathed and because they're useful. And they produce a work in those who allow God's Word to be at work. It builds a foundation of truth. A foundation for what is right and what is wrong. Gives meaning and purpose, identity and self-worth. Hope and resilience. It challenges us to engage the world in a way to serve the world. God's word at work in us is a powerful thing. My hope today is to inspire you to take a step in how you view God's word. And how visible it is in your life. Because disciples of Jesus allow the Bible to work in them. And disciples of Jesus accept it as God's word. And my, my role today as your pastor is to call you to be a disciple of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus. When I look at the disciples of Jesus, I see a small group of people that literally changed the culture of the known world. I see a small group of people that changed history. I see a small group of people whose lives were so radically changed by walking with Jesus and upholding God's word. That it literally changed them, their family tree, and the family trees of people all around them. Let's be disciples. Let's take God's word. 
And let's give it great value in our lives. Because we can point our finger at all kinds of things in society. Oh, well, they, that, they should fix that. And this is when we did that and we took this out of there and we did that. The greatest change agent is what happens in your home. Because what happens in your home determines who you are everywhere you go. And it determines the kind of kids that grow up and come out of your home. Let's be disciples that value God's word. Disciples love and understand God's story. They're able to interpret it and apply it to their life. Disciples embrace a biblical worldview and pursue the principles for a God-honoring life. And can defend their faith humbly and wisely. Disciples obey God's calling to the kingdom and have a personal sense of purpose and calling. Disciples learn the Bible by meditating on scripture. Studying and applying the word as a part of being a part of a local church. Disciples obey the scriptures and mentor others. And applying the Bible into all areas of their life. Let's be disciples. Would you bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. Holy Spirit I thank you. That you are with us. I thank you that you comfort. That you counsel. That you guide. I thank you that you bring to remembrance. God's word in our life. God, I thank you that you are fully present with us at all times. But I'm personally convicted, Lord, and for myself and for my church and for my country, that Holy Spirit, we have devalued the words that you've inspired throughout history. The words that have been preserved For my benefit. God I don't know in each one of our lives. What habits stand in the way. Of your word having a prominent place in our life. For some maybe it's overcoming all kinds of obstacles of belief. Surrounding the scriptures. I pray that you would help them. And you would even give them a passion. To just search and seek out. I think of the Proverbs. Lord it says that. It's the glory of kings to. Search out a matter. I pray that you just give them hunger to search and seek and find. God for some it's just as simple as maybe they need to go to bed at a decent time at night. And wake up early in the morning. God whatever it is that's. A roadblock in our lives. God, spur us on to our next step. That we would be disciples that handle your word. God, that that your word in our hands would be like a basketball in Michael Jordan's. That your word in our hands would be like a, a chisel in stone for Michelangelo. Your word in our hands would produce something beautiful in us and for the world that we live in. We welcome you. We welcome your guidance in this. As you reflect and and pray, I do want to take a moment because maybe there's someone in this place, maybe there's someone watching online you don't have a relationship with God at all. Here's what I know to be true. The scripture has informed me so well. And my life from, from the moment of belief in these truths has been changed dramatically in its confirmation. Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he came from heaven to this earth for one purpose to seek and save that which was lost that's you and me 
We wandered far away from God. Our sins separated us from God. And we couldn't make it back. The chasm was too great. And Jesus' death on the cross took the penalty for sin. And he took, he took it for all of us, for all of mankind, for all of time. So that that would not stand in the way of us approaching God anymore. And so now you can confidently and boldly approach God's throne of grace. You can receive his forgiveness. You can live in a full, uncompromised relationship with the creator of the universe. I know also from scripture that if we believe in our hearts and confess in our mouth that Jesus is Lord, it says that we will be saved. And so if you're in that place right now, I just want to lead you in a prayer to do just that. Pray something like this. Jesus, I place my faith and trust in you. I am thankful for what your word has shown me about your character, your qualities, and, and most importantly, what you've done for me on the cross. I just, I receive it today. That I am forgiven because of your sacrifice. I am made new because of the work that you have done for me. I receive it into my life. I believe it. I trust it. And so now I'm going to boldly and confidently approach you. Every single day of my life. You're not just my creator. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Church, can we celebrate anybody who prayed that prayer this morning? Amen. Amen. I do want to let you know if you prayed that prayer, either on our digital connection card or on that physical one, let me know. Uh, we want to equip you. We want to encourage you. We want to help you learn how to take the next steps in this walk with Jesus. Would you all stand with me in this room? I have a feeling that the Holy Spirit is still working on us, still speaking in our hearts and our lives. And I want to give us this moment. There's a lot of intentionality around the way that even our service is structured. I could, I could finish preaching and praying and then just be like, bye, y'all, because that's the way we said it in Georgia, right? But I think there's something important about slowing down we don't do this enough in our day and age. Slowing down and solidifying in our hearts what God's been doing in us, what he's been speaking to us, and what we're going to do about it. And so in the next few moments, our prayer team's going to be available to pray with you. In fact, if you want to just come and even kneel down on the front of uh, uh, the, the stage of the altar area, you can come and just kneel down and pray. In the back of the room, we have crosses you can pin things to communion elements that you can take and just worship that can be had however you choose to respond in this time don't be thinking about what you're doing next think about being fully present with the Lord in this moment and so prayer team will you go ahead and, and get in place God I thank you for this moment God our lives are so rushed and they're so full of deadlines and appointments and times and schedules. God, I thank you for this moment that we don't have to go anywhere but to be right here. We welcome the work of your Holy Spirit in us. God, if, if we need to grab hands with a brother or sister in Christ this morning and pray, lead us to that. God, if there's some things we need to write down, some decisions, some habits change to incorporate in our life God let us do that God if we just need to be in a place of full surrender and adoration of who you are God let us step fully into it God we give you this moment God we take our stand with you